This video is for chapter nine um, of your textbook, and that chapter is entitled Change. In this chapter, um, it is a little bit more socio-historical um, than previous chapters. Uh, so there is less focus on um, terminology and typologies um, and theories uh, than the focus is more so on how uh, the concepts of like love and marriage and um, sexual intimacy um, are socially constructed. And because they're socially constructed, uh, that means the meaning and the values that we attach to those institutions, um, and it, they, they've changed over time. And really the focus of this chapter is kind of discussing those changes, um, which is why it's entitled Change. So it begins with um, a discussion of diamond rings. It kind of sets a stage um, of a proposal um, that is occurring. But instead of the woman being presented with a diamond, she is presented with a thimble. And then your textbook shares the story that, you know, it used to be that a thimble was the kind of... Um, uh, typical normative token um, that one would give someone uh, if you were proposing to them, um, that rings didn't become a standard sign of betrothal um, until the late uh, 1800s, and then diamond rings didn't become the standard um, until the 1930s. And of course, that was related really to um, diamond uh, jewelry companies um, and just uh, kind of a, a marketing campaign. And so now, of course, you know, we, we think about diamond rings, um, especially rings that, uh, you know, worn on our left hand, on our ring finger, right? You know, we associate that with being a very well-known symbol um, you know, of, of, of being engaged. Um, now, of course, you know, the symbolism of diamonds have further changed because what, um, what diamond uh, ring, uh, you know, companies, jewelers like De Beers, what they discovered is, is, you know, by really just marketing diamond rings to, um, you know, women who are getting engaged, you know, that they were really limiting their consumer base. So I don't know how many of you maybe remember what was called the right hand campaign, but the right hand campaign was specifically geared towards successful women, um, women who perhaps might never marry, who are, or who are becoming, you know, part of that growing demographic of never married, but uh, you know, financially secure on their own. Um, and so it was the idea that you could buy yourself your own um, diamond ring. And you can kind of see that if you look at the ad copy um, from those De Beers campaigns, you know, that they're playing on that idea of independence. So I have a couple um, that, you know, for you uh, to check out. Um, and uh, I'll just read one of them out loud. Um, your left hand sees red and thinks roses. Your right hand see, sees red and thinks wine. Your left hand believes in shining armor. Your right hand thinks knights are for fairy tales. Your left hand says, I love you. Your right hand says, I love me too. Women of the world, raise your right hand. And, and that was kind of the, the tagline, the consistent tagline at the end of all of these ad copies was women of the world, raise your right hand, right? So they were trying to kind of shift that symbolism um, around diamond rings and, 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 and just once again playing with this, the idea that these types of tokens, that these types of rituals, these types of norms are socially constructed. And so therefore the check, the meaning of them, the, you know, values associated with them, what they symbolize, you know, that of course means it's changeable and in flux as well. So before we start talking about these different changes, we're going to talk about changes related to sexual intimacy, um, changes related to courtship um, and dating, and then changes related to marriage. Um, before we get started, you know, let's uh, introduce the concept of, of marriage. Um, marriage is a legally recognized union between two people um, in which they are united sexually, cooperate economically, and may give birth to adopt or rear children. It is the socially approved mating relationship 
um, and it's one that people expect to be uh, stable and enduring. Um, even with divorce, prenuptial agreements, um, you know, the kind of uh, increasing um, popularity around open marriage or um, ethical non-monogamy, um, it's worth noting that research does suggest that when you talk to people, they still have this expectation, or people, um, you know, most people in America, they still have this expectation, you know, that their marriage is going to be stable, it is going to be enduring, um, you know, it's right there in the vows till death do us apart. Even though, of course, um, for 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 many people now, um, you know, they part long before death, um, and and once again, just showing that as we we cling to maybe this kind of traditional idea or notion of marriage, we cling to that traditional notion even in the face of clear changes um, to how the institution is playing out in the day to day lives of real people. Now. What marriage used to be, um, your book t introduces two concepts. Um, first of all, they introduce the concept of the patriarch or property marriage. Um, and so this is the type of marriage that occurred under patriarchy, not the modified patriarchy that we have today, where, you know, you know, technically we do have legal equality. Um, you know, I'm talking about the old school patriarchy where men really were the head of their households, as well as in all leadership positions, head of all leadership positions in, you know, the, the workforce in, in politics, um, in society in general. And women were seen as dependents like children or like property, which is why this is also referred to as property marriage. And then um, that was kind of the the normative model of marriage for a long period of time until, you know, it started to change a little bit in the 1920s. And then it kind of full, those changes were fully ushered in with the concept of traditional marriage, which you can associate with, you know, the 1940s, 1950s. And we will talk about both of these concepts in more detail as we go over our history. So we begin with um, the Puritans. So just some qualities that you should just know about society during this time period. It's an agrarian society, meaning most people are farmers, but they have established, you know, um, stable and enduring townships um, in small cities, meaning they're no longer migratory. Um, it is a patriarchal system, and that system is enforced uh, by church and community. Um, you know, even though, you know, that separation of church and state was not very separate back then, uh, you know, and in these, these families where men were the head of the household, um, you know, oftentimes these were really large families, um, but part of the reason why the, um, the, the number of children were so high is because there was also the risk of high infant mortality rate. And it's also worth noting that there is, you know, also at this time period, um, fairly high uh, maternal mortality rates as well. Um, and so even men, it was not uncommon for men to have multiple wives across their lifetime, not because they were getting a divorce, but because oftentimes women would bear children until their bodies, their health, uh, their lives would give out. And then, of course, men would have to immediately, um, you know, find a, a new replacement, um, not just because they love being married so much, but because of the real logical need and real practical need of needing a, a mother um, for this kind of, you know, large brood of children that had been left behind. So, you know, what were the themes surrounding love, marriage, and, and sex during this time period? Um, so, you know, this is the time period where the patriarch property marriage um, is, is dominant. And people, you know, got married, uh, not usually, uh, you know, or solely on the basis of love, but really, you know, in regards to practical concerns, like we need to merge our land together, this family and that family, or, you know, this person, um, you know, comes from a, a really uh, financially stable background, and we need 
need uh, that type of financial security. We need to marry our daughter into that type of financial security. And that practice of like giving your daughter's hand away, you know, giving away your daughter, you know, that is because at this time period, you know, uh, women were seen as property. You went from being the property of your father to the property of your husband. And your book discusses this when, you know, they talked about when things like sexual assault or, or rape happen, you know, it wasn't so much that it was seen as a violent crime against the woman herself, so much as it was seen as a property crime against either her husband or especially, you know, if you're talking about a young woman that's pres presumed to still be a virgin before the assault took place, you know, it was a it was a crime against her father and against, you know, her financial worth, his ability to, you know, marry her to the right type of mate. Um, and so, you know, people weren't getting married, um, you know, because of this idea of love. It really was um, largely these kind of practical concerns. Doesn't necessarily mean that people didn't experience love. It doesn't mean that they maybe did not even go on to love, you know, their, their spouse, because there are certainly written communications that would suggest otherwise. But just that love was not the... Um, soul or most important or socially acceptable reason why why people would marry. In regards to sex, um, largely, you know, in the Puritan society, all non-marital and non-reproductive sex was forbidden. So this didn't just influence, you know, the fact that therefore sex that was premarital or extramarital was forbidden, but it also meant that sex, certain sexual acts, if it wasn't the type of sexual acts that was going to result in, uh, you know, reproduction in, in the possibility of fertilization, then those acts were, um, you know, forbidden. And of course, you know, obviously that means that same sex, um, you know, attraction um, in, and, and uh, sexual activities were forbidden. And so, you know, the slogan that your, your book provides you is, you know, the idea that sex is for babies. And so with that kind of, you know, rather rigid, uh, you know, um, uh, approach to sex and intimacy, you know, obviously there was a lot of concern about uh, people upholding the, the, the values and, and the morals of the society. Um, and women especially were seen as being especially vulnerable to sexual sin um, and female sexual freedom was curtailed. And of course, you know, um, they maybe justified it with this whole, you know, women much like Eve are more susceptible, you know, to uh, lust. Um, but really, a lot of it was due to concerns related to um, to reproduction and and property. Um, you know, this is before Maury and the ability to, you know, take a test and prove, you know, that the child is or isn't yours, you know, as the saying goes, mama's baby and daddy's maybe. So in a society where, you know, private property and passing on property to your heirs, um, you know, to your descendants was really key and, you know, and there's no way to effectively, uh, you know, test at that time if a child was yours, how they got around that or how they tried to get around that was, of course, by making it um, especially uh, difficult and, um, you know, socially unacceptable and st stigmatizing um, for women to engage in, uh, you know, particularly extramarital sex, um, you know, that could really result in uh, ostracism, um, if not social expulsion. So, you know, think about, um, I don't know how many of you had to read Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Starlet Letter, right? You know, but that was part of the concern, you know, that that is an example of a puritanical society. Um, and the fact that she was, you know, had to walk around with that scarlet A, right? Because in these societies, the fear that men were, raising, you know, babies that weren't theirs, leaving their property to children who might not be theirs. I mean, that fear was real. And, and this was the way that they addressed that. But that's, but 
despite that being the case. Um, due to population concerns, sexual deviation was rarely punished by the most extreme measures on the book, particularly if the sexual deviation, you know, was related to like premarital sex. Um, you know, there weren't enough people, particularly in these societies, there oftentimes weren't enough women, you know, for you to, uh, imprison or expel or, you know, in, you know, uh, uh, put to death, you know, a woman um, who has engaged in um, one of these uh, so-called sexual sins. Um, and then, of course, we also know that particularly in regards to the men, you know, they broke their sexual code and in, in, uh, as well um, and oftentimes without punishment, uh, particularly in regards to the sexual violence that was perpetuated on women of other races. Your textbook mentions African and Native American women in particular. So the comparative uh, North American society during this time period um, is are the Native Americans. Um, and so although we don't know the exact number of Native Americans uh, who were in the area we now, we now considered to be the United States, um, before European arrival, you know, there are anthropological estimates uh, that put it up to 18 million um, at that time. And of course, although we think about this as being like a unified group, um, you know, they were enormously diverse, right? You know, they did not consider themselves to be one people or, you know, one tribe. Um, so, uh, you know, they were diverse in terms of how their societies were organized. They were diverse in terms of their belief systems. They were diverse in terms of their languages. Um, but there are just kind of some larger themes that that come out of, uh, you know, anthropological research on these early Native American tribes. For one thing, um, almost all of them were hunter-gatherer societies, what your book refers to as forager societies. So unlike the agrarian societies of the Puritans, which were relatively stable and stayed in one spot, of course, these um, societies, they did a lot of moving um, as they were kind of uh, following food. Um, and the fact that they were not staying in one spot um, was, is, was one of the things that probably contributes to um, some real distinctions that we see between these societies and the Puritan society. So admittedly, um, you know, their sexual lives seemed particularly scandalous to the Europeans at the time. Um, for one thing, there was acceptance of sexual, um, you know, sexual relations outside of committed relationships. Um, you know, depending on the society, there was oftentimes a practice of both monogamy as well as polygamy. Gender nonconformity was accepted, as were same-sex relationships. Um, and a lot of this kind of sexual kind of freedom and tolerance, uh, as well as the fact that for a lot of tribes, they were matrilineal, 25% of the tribes were matrilineal, and even the ones that weren't matrilineal, very few of them had the kind of rigid patriarchal structures that you saw in, in Puritan societies. And, you know, a lot of that is probably related to the fact that, you know, being a forager society, they didn't really view property as something that could be owned. And because it could not be owned, you know, they did not necessarily have to worry about passing it along to their, you know, direct descendants or their heirs. Um, and so this led to them having a very different view of children um, in the sense that, you know, regardless of who the father was, children were seen as belonging to the, the tribe, um, or if if not or the the kinship group, if not the tribe, um, and of course, if this is your view of children, then it maybe makes sense why they were able to have kind of more tolerant and um, looser, uh, if you will, sexual regulation. You know, going back to. Uh, a lot of what is at heart in the Puritan society, you know, beyond, you know, their kind of uh, religious uh, beliefs is, of course, that concern around reproduction and that concern around inheritance. 
if you take away that concern around inheritance, then you don't have to regulate sexuality nearly as closely, particularly female sexuality. Um, if you aren't focusing on whether or not a child is, is, is your biological child and therefore is worthy to, you know, inherit your land. If you don't believe that land is something that can be owned and inherited, this literally kind of frees you up from that mindset. Um, but that was not the mindset, obviously, of, of the Europeans that had settled in America in that time. And that, that even though Purit Puritan societies, you know, um, although they kind of evolved and, and they modernized, um, that model of, of the patriarchal property marriage, that model of, you know, sexual repressiveness and especially, you know, women, um, you know, kind of being, um, unable or, or more restricted in the sexual realm, you know, that model kind of persisted in America beyond the Puritan communities for, um, you know, a, a couple of centuries until we reached the um, turn of the century when the Industrial Revolution occurred. So, you know, the key thing about the Industrial Revolution, what really just resulted in a lot of changes is the fact that it meant that instead of being an agrarian society, societies were now becoming more industrial. So instead of people, you know, working from home on their family farm, they are now going, you know, to work um, largely in factories um, and they're getting paid for that work. So there is paid labor or wage labor. So now you are making money. I um, mean, you're spending your day like making this product that, you, you know, doesn't belong to you. You know, it belongs to whoever owns your factory and they're just paying you for your time. And so this also means that instead of producing now a lot of your own goods, the way that it was on family farms, right, where people were raising their own food, maybe raising their own, you know, livestock and therefore making their own clothes. Um, you know, now, of course, uh, you know, you're not doing that. So you have to buy those things. And so what we also have at the same time as work becoming separate from home is we have what your book calls the commodification of society. You're working for money and you now use that money to, to pay for things, um, things that maybe 100, 200 years ago you would have made yourself on your family farm. Now, why was this significant for family life? That's because that, you know, um, for the first time in large numbers, we have a division of labor based largely on gender. Um, on the family farm, you know, it's a patriarchal society. So the men are the head of the household, but both men and working are working in that household. And in some cases, you know, it wasn't even like an inside outside divide, right? It's like you both are working in the family fields. You're both working to, you know, raise and take care of the livestock. Um, so even though it is patriarchal, at least in terms of work, um, you know, the work itself was maybe, you know, more egalitarian in the sense that you are both, you know, your home is your livelihood and you're both contributing in, in similar ways. But now that you have this wage labor, now that you have people going outside of the home to work, what happens for a lot of families, particularly married uh, families is that the husband goes, uh, you know, out to work and and makes wages for his labor, and the woman stays at home. And now the the home is no longer seen as the source of the livelihood; it's just seen as the personal home. Um, and so, you know, if you want to start thinking about, and and we'll talk about this more later in this lecture, but if you want to start thinking about, like, when did women's labor maybe start to become devalued? It's during this time period, right? because now the home is no longer revenue generating. Um, and so it's not that she's working less, but this work now has less value in a society based around wage labor and commodification. The impact on children, um, you don't need as many children um, if you don't have the family farm. You know, in an agrarian society where most people were farmers, people needed children, particularly boys, because that was like your work crew.
um, they helped work the land. But now, if you no longer have a farm and, and you're going off to work, although, you know, labor laws and, and, and school, you know, laws mandating, uh, you know, education haven't been passed yet, children no longer have the same economic value. Um, and so what you start to see is, of course, shrinking families. And there's no longer this kind of reproduction imperative. So what's going to happen to our motto that sex is for babies? Well, what you now need is a new logic um, to guide sexual activity. If sex is no longer for babies, then what is it for? And so your textbook talks about, you know, during this time period, we, you can see in the, the media, um, you know, of that time, the books and, and the, the music and, 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 and and the arts that come out during this time, you can start to see this new logic um, being pushed, what's called the gendered love sex binary, where you have this association, um, you know, of women with love, you know, that women are looking for love, that they're looking for romance, that good women are not interested into sex, that they don't have these kind of carnal pleasures and desires, um, and that men are more lustful. So, you know, as opposed to what we saw in Puritan societies, where, of course, it was women we were concerned about in regards to sexual sins. Now, with the gendered love sex binary, literally women are just, um, are kind of divorced from the idea of, of having kind of sexual, you know, a half of having a sexual nature and sex becomes masculinized. It becomes associated with men. And so this is that beginning of the sexual double standard, right? That, you know, what was acceptable for men sex sexually um, is not acceptable for women. And so what we start to see, because sex is no longer just about reproduction, and we start to see these messages that men have sexual urges that go beyond marriage that they can't control, we see this like rise in prostitution. Now, admittedly, there had been prostitutes before, but what we really see during this time period, and, and of course, this was probably aided by the fact that we also have the growth of, of cities happening as well urbanization. But what we see, of course, is this is this great increase in prostitution. And we have what your book calls, you know, this good girl, bad girl dichotomy, um, which we've talked about in this class already in regards of the Madonna whore um, uh, dichotomy. Um, but this idea that good women aren't interested in sex, that men shouldn't expect good women to be interested in sex, that they should not expect to get all of their sexual needs or urges met by the good women, i.e. the wives in their lives, but that bad women are interested in sex. And while you can't marry this type of woman, you definitely can have sex with this type of woman. And it was sexual and it was socially acceptable because of the sexual double standard. Now, of course, these women did not have high standing and they were not, you know, granted respectability um, in, in larger society. Um, because, of course, they were, you know, um, not conforming to that sexual double standard. They were on the wrong side of the Madonna whore, good girl, bad girl dichotomy. Um, but what this really um, is, is what's really kind of uh, important about this time period is that especially for men, um, a lot of that, those like sexual, you know, repressive, um, you know, strict dictates that came out of the Puritan era, they are being lifted for men. It's worth noting that, you know, unless you're a prostitute, they're not being lifted for women.